When you look at some of the best known brands in the world, you don't need reminding about what they are or what they do. For example, what about this one? Or this one? Then there's this one. And their main rivals, this one. And even though, with one exception, none of these brands actually have the name of the company or the product in them, you can tell by looking exactly what the company is and exactly what they make. For example, you can tell just by looking at this collection which company makes running shoes and which company makes computer software. And in fact, if a brand is really successful, you only have to see its name or logo, even out of context, to be reminded about what the company does or what the product is. I mean, for example, take a look at this photograph here. Now, if you're familiar with the brand, you'll know that even though it's on the side of a racing car, it's got nothing to do with motoring, it's got nothing to do with motor racing at all. But you know exactly what it is, uh, and if you live in a market where they don't sell this, I'll tell you it's an energy drink. But if you do live somewhere where they do sell this product, you'll know immediately exactly what it is just by looking at the brand. And it's the same online as it is offline. So you need to be consistent. So if you're, let's say you're Sam Owen 101 on Facebook and new video for you on Twitter and new video to go on YouTube and Sam Owen's video productions on LinkedIn and new videos for you on Pinterest, well, nobody is going to know that you're the same person or the same business. Likewise, if your website has one color scheme and your Facebook page has another and your Twitter feed has another and you use a different logo on your letterhead than you do online, well, quite frankly, people are not going to take you seriously. So how can you be consistent? Well, really, this is something that you must do from the very beginning. So when you're just starting out, you need to decide on a business name. Now, of course, I suppose the obvious way is to just simply use your name. But that can be problematical if you ever decide to sell the business onto somebody else. You're also selling the rights to your name. So generally, if you plan on perhaps selling your business on later on, then using your name isn't a very good idea. What is a very good idea, though, is something that is descriptive of what you do. So if you make a, uh, a particular product or you sell a particular service, then including that in your business name is a good idea. And likewise, you can also include keywords as part of your business name that will make it easy for search engines to find you and it will sort of stick in people's minds that you are or your company is or does this particular thing and it's a keyword that sort of lodges in their brain. Regardless, you should have something that's easy to remember, something that's not too convoluted, something that uh, easily trips off the tongue, something that people can sort of lodge somewhere in their brain. And when they need your product, they need your service, they can simply think, ah, oh, yes, we can have so-and-so. Or, for example, you could have something cryptic. Probably the best example of this that I know is Nike. And Nike was the ancient Greek goddess of victory. So, of course, a bit cryptic there. They were sort of thinking, well, Nike, victory, wear our shoes, cross the finish line first, that sort of thing. Something else that you really do need to do is to make sure that nobody else is using it. If you go to a whole lot of trouble of setting yourself up with a business name and then you find that actually somebody else is using it, you're going to have to start all over again. You also want to make sure that it's not deliberately confused with another more established business. And I'll give you a real life example here. Here in the UK, there is a chain of pharmacies and drugstores called Boots, Boots the Chemist. And they are a regular presence on just about every high street and shopping mall in the country. Now, I know of this guy whose name was Booth. And he started 
a chemist shop. He was a pharmacist by profession, and he started a chemist shop, and he called it Booths the Chemist. Well, Boots the Chemist weren't very happy about this, and I'm told that they got him to change the name of his shop so that it couldn't be confused with theirs. So you do have to be very careful when choosing a business name that you can't purposely confuse it with another company. Something else that you should do is to have the same color scheme. So you want to have the same color scheme on all of your social media sites. You want to have the same color scheme on your website. And also offline, if you run um, a bricks and mortar business, you want to make sure that your letterhead, that your signage, if you have a van, you want to make sure that it has the same colors as the rest of your business so that you've got you know, a completely seamless association in the customer's mind between those colors and you. You also want to have the same logo. And this is very important because, like I was saying earlier in the video, people will associate the logo with you. So you need to make sure that it is the same across all social media sites. And it's a good idea to get it professionally designed. You can find someone to design a logo for you on Fiverr.com. That's Fiverr with two R's. And this is a site where people would do all sorts of stuff for $5 or for multiples of $5. And you can see here, I've done a search for logo design, and there are quite a number of different people offering uh, this particular service. You should also have the same handle or username on all of your social media. Like I was saying earlier in the video, if you're one name on Facebook and a different one on Twitter and a different one on Pinterest, then people aren't going to know that you're the same person or the same business. So it's a good idea to go through and register an account on all the different types of media, all the different social media platforms, even the ones that you don't plan on using, primarily because this will stop other people from hijacking your name and trading off your goodwill. Likewise, you should register all the extensions of your domain name. So you want to have your domain name .com, .net, .co, .tv, .co.uk, .com.au, etc., etc. So finally, you want to get things set up so that whenever somebody sees your logo, hears your business name, or sees your handle, they'll automatically think of you. And then you know that they've become true fans. In this video, I want to talk about ways that you can grow your Twitter fan base. Now, Twitter is a fantastic tool for marketing and getting more fans and followers. But most people don't use it correctly. And you must make it easy for your fans to find and follow you. And this means having the same branding as on other sites. Now, for example, let's say you run a site in the fitness niche called Ultimate Fitness Supplies and you supply home gym equipment, say. Well, you would want to call your business obviously Ultimate Fitness Supplies. You would have your website, ultimatefitnesssupplies.com. On Facebook, you'd be facebook.com forward slash Ultimate Fitness Supplies. On Twitter, you'd be at Ultimate Fitness Supplies and so on. And you keep that up all the way across. Something else that you should do on Twitter, and it's very simple, but surprisingly people don't, is to simply ask people to follow you. And if you place a Twitter button on your website and ask people to follow you, well, that's usually enough. But if you find people still aren't signing up, it could be because of one or two things. First of all, Either no one knows that it's there, so you'll need to make your sign-up button a bit more prominent, or you're not providing enough incentive for people to want to sign up. And this can be a big problem. So instead of just leaving it to chance, why not say in the occasional blog post something like, to stay up to date with all our latest content and special offers, please follow us on Twitter or for exclusive special offers, 
follow us on Twitter. And then occasionally perhaps you might tweet a coupon code number to your Twitter fans that they can use to get a discount uh, when they come to check out if you have um, a shopping cart site, that sort of thing. So it gives people a really good incentive to follow you on Twitter because there's something in it for them as well as being able to receive all your latest tweets. Now, something like this might just be enough to draw attention to your Twitter feed and get people interested. And this works even better in video, so if you occasionally vlog, be sure to ask people to sign up at the end of each video. And you can perhaps have a graphic that says, you know, follow us on Twitter and then uh, your Twitter tag, etc. And once you have a decent number of followers then you can use the option to have this number displayed. And this can be really powerful because people love to follow the herd. And you can create a follow button quite easily on this site, which is publish.twitter.com. And just simply enter your Twitter URL in here and follow the on-screen instructions. But of course, the best way to get people to follow you on Twitter is to simply deliver quality content, content that people want to read. But unfortunately, so many people get this one totally wrong. So let's look at these particular tweets. And let's say, again, that you're in the fitness niche. Something like this. You know, Do you want to get in shape faster? Try our hashtag chin up, hashtag bar, hashtag fitness, hashtag hypertrophy. Running in a marathon? Make sure your hashtag training, hashtag shoes are up to the task. We're offering a 10% discount to new clients for this month only. Sign up now at, and you've got the bit.ly URL there, hashtag deals. Our dumbbells come in a range of weights and sizes, hashtag dumbbells, hashtag weightlifting. You get the point. So what's wrong with this exactly? Well, it would be quicker to ask what's right with it. I mean, think about it. Would you follow that kind of a Twitter account? You know, what would be the point? If you were an existing customer or fan, seeing adverts for something you were already using wouldn't offer much value. And if you weren't an existing customer, you'd probably be frustrated and annoyed by all the constant nagging. So the question you need to ask yourself is, what would your customers want to read? So put yourself in your customer's shoes. And seeing as we're on a fitness uh, theme here, put yourself in their running shoes. You know, what would they like to know about? Well, as you're in the fitness niche, you could provide fitness tips or workout advice, diet ideas, etc. If you run a blog on martial arts, then discuss moves and your favorite martial arts film. You know, think of each tweet as a mini product and try to ensure that the reader benefits from it in some way. Now, whether that's by being entertained or by learning something, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. Also, for business niches, industry news can also prove very popular. Another approach to take is a little less on the nose. You know, instead of directly discussing your niche, your industry or your service, you can talk about the lifestyle of people involved with your topic instead. You know, try and sell the idea that you're all part of a community and tweet about subjects that might inspire or subjects that your audience can relate to. And you don't have to come up with original material every time either. You can retweet tweets from other leading players in your niche And this helps to build a sense of community and it tells followers that it's okay to retweet your tweets too. And of course, then you'll spread your word much further and wider than you would do if it was just to your own followers. So there you go, just a few ways that you can grow your Twitter fan base. In this video, I want to show you ways of getting more Facebook fans. Now, basically, there are two ways of getting more Facebook fans. You can either grow your following organically or you can buy advertising that um, promotes your Facebook page. 
Let's talk about how you can grow your following organically because that's probably the best way of doing so. It's certainly the cheapest. And of course, the best way to grow more Facebook fans is to give them a reason to visit your Facebook page. And basically, that means posting useful, interesting content. And if you post stuff your target audience wants to read, they will, first of all, read it. They'll like it. They'll follow you so they can read more of it. And they'll tell others who might be interested too. So you'll grow your fan base that way. When you're posting content, it's always a good idea to post a picture or a GIF alongside your post. And it makes it more eye-catching and interesting. And if possible, you should post an original picture if you have one, preferably one that ties into the content of, of the page and perhaps shows you uh, in it as well, because then it basically cements it and ties it all together. You should also have share buttons on your website or on your blog. And this can encourage people to like, share and follow you on Facebook. You should also interact with the comments and respond. You know, don't just simply post up your Facebook page and then go away and don't come back until you're starting something else. You know, join in the conversation. Be a part of the community. Make sure that people know that you're going to interact with them uh, if they post a comment uh, on your Facebook page. And you can also use other social media to promote your page. You know, things like YouTube, Twitter. Pinterest, Reddit, etc. You can all link them together so that they go back to your Facebook page. In fact, if you're posting a video on YouTube, this is actually very easy because you can simply put something at the end that says follow us on Facebook and gives the URL. So it is actually quite easy to do it that way. The other way that you can get more Facebook fans is by purchasing advertising so that it leads people to your page who perhaps wouldn't stumble upon it organically. Now, Facebook ads, which is what the uh, system is on Facebook, work in a similar way to Google AdWords. In other words, they're PPC or pay-per-click. But unlike Google AdWords, they're more varied and they can be more tightly targeted. For example, you can target people by their age, gender, location, interests, marital status, etc., etc. Now let's look at the different types of ad that you can have on Facebook. There used to be all sorts of different types, but now they whittled it down to just a few. And I suppose the most popular one is the promoted post. And the supported placements for that are in the right column, mobile feed and news feed. And this is a great way of getting a larger audience engaged with an important piece of content or promotion. And for a set budget, you can boost a post which will increase its visibility in the feed of people who like your page as well as their friends. So again, it's going to get them right in front of the post that you want them to read. Then there's the boosted post, which is slightly different. And its supported placements are right column, mobile feed, and news feed as well. And it's available to pages with 50 likes or more. And it's basically a simpler version of promoted posts. And you can choose fans of your page and their friends, or you can choose to select by targeting criteria. Then there's a domain ad. And the supported placement for this is the right column. And domain ads are essentially adverts that appear in the sidebar and point directly to a website that you're hosting. So you can go straight to your website. And these are perhaps the simplest form of ads and are composed of a simple heading and a block of text. And it's a bit like Google AdSense, if you're familiar with uh, that type of advertising, AdWords, AdSense. Then there's the multi-product. And this is placed in the news feed and the mobile news feed. And multi-product ads, as you would expect, display multiple items on a slideshow type display that lets users browse and shop right from Facebook. And this is incredibly powerful for e-commerce stores. And it means you're really only posting one ad to promote a whole range of products. 
Then there's the page like, and this supported placement. So this one is the right column newsfeed and mobile newsfeed. And this is an advert for your Facebook page, essentially. And with these, you're trying to increase your number of likes so that you can generate a bigger audience to market to. Then there are video ads, and the supported placements are the right column, newsfeed, and mobile newsfeed. And video ads let you showcase a video. And these are good for getting likes, and they're powerful for video marketing. Then there are app ads, and the supported placements are the right column and the newsfeed. And if you have built a branded app for Facebook, then this is how you can promote it and encourage downloads. Then there's an event ad. Now, these are in the right column, newsfeed and mobile newsfeed. And they, as the name would imply, allow you to advertise events. And this can be useful for increasing interest for a company launch event, for instance, or a conference, or if you've got a bricks and mortar store and you're running a special event or a promotion, then you can use this uh, to tell people about it. And finally, there's an offer. And the supported placements are the right column, newsfeed, and mobile newsfeed. And an offer advert is useful for companies who want to market a special offer. And anyone who clicks on your ad will be emailed a code that they can use in order to redeem your special offer. And you know, this is great for encouraging sales. And all of these different ways will help you to build your fan base. Because even if it's something like an offer ad, people are going to know about your Facebook page and you can encourage them to like you and follow you and so on. So this is just a few ways that you can build your Facebook following, build your Facebook fan base. In this video, I want to give you some tips on building a massive YouTube following. Now, why is it that some YouTube videos get so many views they practically break the counter, yet others get seen so infrequently the page looks like Tombstone before the outlaws ride in? And how come some YouTube channels have many thousands of subscribers and their video stats hit four figures within a few hours, whereas others might get one or two subscribers a year and their videos never get viewed a hundred times before they get taken down? Well, there are a number of different answers to that question. And while you might not have as many views and subscribers as Gangnam Style, you can certainly build a solid following and get a decent number of views for your videos. The main determining factor for how popular your videos are going to be comes down to your niche, and some niches are more popular than others. In general internet marketing, the biggest niches are fitness, dating, self-help, and making money. But some of the most popular subjects for YouTube videos outside of those big internet marketing niches are gaming, makeup tutorials, grooming and style, travel, technology, fails, cats, DIY, comedy, and lifestyle vlogs. So you need to pick a niche that's going to be popular, but Often the most popular niches are the most competitive and oversaturated. So if you do a series of videos on how to do the perfect workout routine, you're going to be up against some fairly big names who already have a massive following, and you'll find it very hard to compete. So what should you do? Well, one thing is to pick a popular niche, but concentrate on a particular aspect of it. And this is known as niching down or niching down, as some people pronounce it. So let's say you're in the golf niche. Instead of doing just general golf videos, you could do tutorials on how to hit the perfect swing or do the perfect putt. You could show how to hit with each type of iron or wood, or you could have tips to play different holes at different golf courses or different links. And of course, when golf goes wrong, it's always a good topic for humour. Or why not pick an obscure sport like handball? Now, 
it's not as popular, so it's not as competitive, at least off the field anyway. But there's also not much out there. So videos on this topic do rack up an awful lot of views fairly quickly. But of course, it doesn't matter how good your content is. If you can't get people to your channel, no one's going to see it. So there's not a lot of point. So how can you get a lot of people to your channel quite easily? Well, a keyword rich description and title will help YouTube to determine what your video is all about. And so when people type in what they're searching for on YouTube, YouTube will go through, they'll use the keywords and they'll pull yours out and it'll come up either in the listing or in the suggested videos at the side. Something else you can do is if your video is scripted, be sure to include plenty of keywords and then upload the script to YouTube so that it can be used for subtitles and closed captions. And then that will help YouTube also to decide exactly where your video is and exactly what your video is about. Now, some good tools to find keywords are the Google AdWords Keyword Planner. Uh, this is quite a long URL, so if you just go to Google and type in Google AdWords Keyword Planner, you'll be directed to this site. Or something a bit more in-depth, you can use Market Samurai, which you can find here at marketsamurai.com. And this is a paid-for solution, although there is a free trial offer running at the time that I'm making this video. Something else you can do is use other social media to drive traffic. So tweet about your video upload on Twitter, you know, just sending a tweet saying I've uploaded a new video and then the URL uh, can also get people to look at you just out of curiosity, really. Or you can post it on Facebook or you can share it on sites like Reddit or Google Plus. And Google Plus is actually very good because Google owns YouTube and they also own Google Plus. So there's a lot of synergy between the three areas. So uh, if you've got something on YouTube, you can put it up on Google Plus as well. And it'll also show up very well in the Google search engine rankings. Something else you can do is to embed your YouTube video onto your blog as part of a blog post. And if you have a WordPress blog, this is actually very easy to do. You just simply embed the URL and WordPress takes care of the rest. And you should also make it easy for others to share your video on their sites. To make your YouTube videos easy to share, make sure that all this works properly once you've uploaded your video. You want to make sure that there is a, a URL or share link that people can access and that they've got the buttons here that people can share on various other social media sites. Also to make sure that you've got the embed code like here to go on an HTML site and that people can email uh, your uh, URLs. Uh, you have to sign in to do this and I haven't, but usually there'll be a, a link here that you can use. Instagram and Pinterest are often overlooked by marketers, which is a big mistake because you can actually generate a lot of traffic and sales from these particular two types of social media. Now, for the uninitiated, I better explain that Instagram and Pinterest are picture-based media. And they cater mostly for a female audience and are generally reached via smartphones. So let's look at each of these in a bit more detail. First of all, Instagram. Now, Instagram is an app that's growing in popularity. It has over 300 million users and it's adding more every day. Now, at its most basic, Instagram is an image sharing app and a fairly low quality one at that. But that's not to say it can't form a key part of your social media strategy. In fact, some really big companies are using Instagram to get their message across. Companies like Sharpie, Starbucks and Target, to name but a few. And sports teams like the LA Clippers basketball team are heavy Instagram users too. 
And there are two good uses that you can put Instagram to. One is influencer marketing, and the other is local marketing. Influencer marketing means you find someone who already has a large following on Instagram and has established themselves as an authority. And these people will have the ability to sway the opinions of a large group of followers, which of course is where you eventually want to be. So instead of spending months or years trying to reach this point, why not piggyback on the success of someone who's already got there? Or to put it another way, why not see if you can't get someone to post on your behalf to their audience? Of course, there needs to be something in it for them, and this could mean that you pay them, you promote them on another social media in exchange for them promoting you, you know, something like an ad swap, uh, but on social media rather than email. Or you could just try targeting influential members of the public and hope that they'll like your brand enough to do it for free, although that doesn't happen very often, if I'm honest. Likewise, when you've built up a large Instagram following, you can offer to post for other people in your niche in return for them posting for you in another media so you can spread your net a bit wider. Instagram is also great for local audiences. And this is because the pictures have an optional location tag, which you can use to help users geolocate your bricks and mortar store. And this can be very useful for drumming up business. So say, for example, you have a hairdresser's or a salon. You could ask your clients if you could take a photo of them with their new hairdo and post that on Instagram and ask them to do the same if they have an Instagram account. So you're going to spread the word out to all their friends and followers. Now, Instagram is a perfect match for Twitter as the two sites use the same type of hashtag. And it's easy to link an Instagram photo into a tweet. Then let's talk about Pinterest, because Pinterest is slightly different. It's still based around pictures, but they use it in slightly different ways. Essentially, Pinterest works by creating mood boards. And a mood board is essentially a collage made up of images and other materials that you've either created yourself or you found on the web. For example, one of the most popular types of boards that users will create are wedding boards. And when an engaged couple begin planning their wedding, they'll often start by creating a Pinterest board and then looking for inspiration. They'll look at boards created by other users and search for ideas for wedding dresses, wedding locations, table decorations, wedding cakes, suits, etc. Or they may create separate boards for each of those things. And there are many ways that Pinterest gets used by marketers. For example, you could showcase a new web design or app UI. You could have ideas for interior design. You can put together inspirational images to get people to keep fit if you're in the fitness niche. You could have things like moves or goal physiques, etc. You can keep customers updated with your brand in a more visual way. You could perhaps, if you have a clothing site, you could have fashion and outfit ideas. If you're a tattoo artist, you could showcase tattoo ideas and much more. Now, beyond the basic features, there are also some more advanced options and tools on Pinterest that are going to be especially useful for marketers. And one of them is Rich Pins. Now, Rich Pins, as it says here on the page, are pins that include extra information right on the pin itself. And there are six types of Rich Pins. There's app, movie, recipe, article, product, and place. And if you come here to this page, business.pinterest.com forward slash en forward slash rich hyphen pins, you can see it explains all about them. And you can click the links to uh, get more information in detail on all of them. Finally, Pinterest also provides a large amount of analytics data. Now, to get this, you'll need to convert your personal account to a business account, and at the same time, you'll need to verify your account. 
From there, you'll be able to see what pins are getting pinned from your website or your blog. This in turn lets you see which content is really performing well and engaging your audience. And there are other advantages of making this switch too. Can you promote your blog or business with a personal account? Well, of course you can, to an extent, but there are some considerable advantages of making the switch. To start with, Pinterest actually requires you to make your Pinterest account a business one if you intend on using it for profit. A brand new feature of Pinterest is Pinterest Ads. And as the name would suggest, it enables you to actually buy advertising on the Pinterest platform. And this is brand new, so not very many marketers are using it at the moment. And you can find out more at ads.pinterest.com. So there you go, just some ways that you can use Instagram and Pinterest in your marketing mix. LinkedIn is a much smaller social network than the likes of say, Facebook. But that's its strength. You see, LinkedIn is exclusively for businesses and business people. Here are a few stats. One out of every three professionals is on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the world's largest professional network and gives you access to the largest group of influential and successful individuals anywhere. As of 2015, the last year of which statistics are available, LinkedIn had 364 million members. And LinkedIn continues to grow rapidly. The same time the previous year, the site had 296 million members. LinkedIn has members in over 200 different countries. And it's one of the oldest social networks, having been formed in December 2002. So even if you're not in a business niche per se, it still makes sense to be on LinkedIn. And you can target business people for leisure niches and big ticket items, and you can network with other marketers. And that's LinkedIn's biggest strength. It's a network. It's a tool for self-promotion, giving you access to a gigantic network of contacts operating within your field, and it gives you the means to reach them to work with them and to be seen by them. Now, when it comes to marketing, you can use LinkedIn to increase awareness, to build brand loyalty, to create a more professional impression for your brand and for your services or your products, to promote a website and gain SEO or social media marketing benefits, to find potential clients and customers, and to build leads and keep in contact with them. So when it comes to creating your LinkedIn strategy, well, the best place to start is actually the beginning. So if you haven't done so, come over to linkedin.com and sign up. And the first thing that you'll need to do is create a profile. And there are two types of profile that you can create on LinkedIn. Uh, the first is your own professional profile, which would be a profile for you specifically. And the second is the profile that you'll create for your business, which is where you'll promote your brand instead of yourself. Now, to begin with, you'll want to start your personal profile on LinkedIn. And um, what this is going to do, basically, is act as a springboard for your other activities. And so the idea is to sell yourself and make yourself look professional and accomplished while you're doing so. Now, I won't go through the entire procedure here as it's pretty straightforward. Nevertheless, it's best to write everything out ahead of time on your word processor so that it reads well and it places you in the best possible light. Now, your profile is basically your CV or resume online, so you need to be consistent and make sure that what you say stacks up. Bear in mind that people will look elsewhere online to verify what you put here and any contradictions with information that can be found elsewhere will destroy your credibility in an instant. Once you've made your LinkedIn profile, the next thing you'll want to add is your company page. And this is basically like a profile, except you'll be writing about your business rather than about yourself personally. 
And this means you should write in a manner that sounds a little more detached and professional, and you should focus on the value proposition. You know, how do people stand to gain from using your products or services, as well as things like the mission statement and goals. Now, they do rather hide how you uh, set up a company page. So if you come to linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash ad forward slash show, uh, then you fill in your company name, your email address, you check the box here that says I verify I'm an official representative and then click continue. Now your email address at the company must be at the company domain. So if you try and enter a Gmail address in here, for example, uh, you'll get rejected. Now there are two main ways you can reach an audience on LinkedIn for free. Influencer marketing and content marketing. You can also buy paid advertising, but I'm not going to cover that in this video. Now, influencer marketing means you're going to stop trying to reach as wide an audience as possible with your own marketing. And instead, you're going to focus on the quality of the audience that you market to. Now, this might mean focusing on one individual and getting them to promote something that you have to say. So, for example, if you were to take conventional marketing on Twitter, I know we're talking about LinkedIn, but let's talk about if you're going to do this on Twitter for a moment. Now, you might spend countless hours trying to build your number of followers and then trying to create new content to help increase your engagement. And over countless hundreds of hours spread over months or even years, you will build enough of a following to become an influencer in your niche and start getting more business every time you tweet. Well, with influencer marketing, you skip this step. Instead, you focus on creating a relationship with someone who already has a huge amount of influence. Now, let's take Bill Gates, for example. If you could somehow reach Bill Gates and get him to tweet about your product and to include your Twitter username, you would certainly get thousands of new followers overnight and gigantic sales for your products or services. So in other words, you could leapfrog all of the competition by going directly to a key influencer who has the ears and hearts of your audience. And this way, a single retweet, guest post or shout out could be of an order of magnitude more effective than hundreds or even thousands would regularly be. The problem is Bill Gates probably doesn't want to shout out for you on social media and you probably have no means of reaching him anyway. People like Mr. Gates get spanned by hundreds, if not thousands of people every day and probably have an army of minions to wade through it all for them. Only the really important messages from people that they know and trust get through. And here's where it's easier to contact people via LinkedIn because this is where LinkedIn's degrees of separation come in. If you could find someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew Bill Gates, you would be connected by three degrees of separation. And like I was saying earlier, this is where the fact that LinkedIn is a network can be very helpful. Because anyone who is connected to you by three degrees of separation or less will show how you're connected to them when you view their profile and when they view yours, of course. So you'll be able to go onto LinkedIn and see the people you need to go through to get an introduction to Bill Gates. And what's more, if you're connected by someone with three degrees or less, you'll be able to send them in mail. Now, this is a message they'll receive in their LinkedIn inbox, which statistically has a good chance of being opened. And suddenly it becomes all the more possible that you could reach a big influencer in your niche. And then there's content marketing. Now, like influencer marketing, it's an incredibly powerful marketing tool. In fact, content marketing is considered the natural evolution of search engine optimization, and it's now an integral part of almost every business's marketing strategy. And content marketing means putting high quality articles onto your blog and posting them on LinkedIn to share with your connections. It also means joining groups and participating in the discussions. Now, 
don't use these as tools for direct selling because that's going to be a real turn off instead what you're doing is converting your linkedin connections into potential fans and regular visitors to your website or blog and this might also lead to some people signing up to your mailing list or even becoming direct customers or clients if your site is good at converting at the same time if you keep posting great quality content to your linkedin network you'll find that they start to think of you as someone who knows what he or she is talking about with regards to that subject or niche and this is the other huge benefit of content marketing it allows you to demonstrate your knowledge and to give your visitors a free taste and eventually they should come to consider you as a leading authority in your field and as such they might seek out your opinion when looking for products services and other ways to spend money and it's at this point you become an influencer yourself and give yourself a platform to which to launch joint ventures launch partnerships or other business ventures and it's all down to participating on linkedin linkedin has its own advertising platform that enables you to directly advertise to other members of linkedin and this is perfect if you're a b2b marketer or you target a business related niche essentially this is a ppc network in other words it's pay per click that works similarly to facebook or google adwords so you only have to pay when someone actually clicks on your ads although you can also pay per impression and you'll generally only pay a few cents for each click but the more you pay the more often your ad will appear just like on facebook or adwords and this is very effective because it means you don't have to pay anything if your ad is ineffectual and doesn't generate any traffic whatsoever like facebook ads and google adwords linkedin allows you to carefully target who sees your ads and this is fantastic for b2b organizations as it lets you specifically market to decision makers within your industry what's more linkedin ads also work incredibly well for recruiting now there are two main types of advertisements the two that are most popular and they are sponsored content and text ads and that's what i'm going to concentrate on in this video there are also display ads dynamic ads and sponsored in mail which is a bit like sending out a solo ad but uh, to people on linkedin rather than through email now sponsored content does exactly what it says on the tin you basically pay to get your article or post in front of the sort of people you want to read it now when you're doing this you should make this article direct and not too wordy because lots of people access linkedin on smartphones and you should include a call to action at the end now don't make it a blatant sales pitch though or you'll just put people off reading it consider it a free taster for your product or service now text ads are similar to the sort of ads that you see as google adsense and these appear at either the top or in the sidebar of linkedin pages and just like with adsense stroke adwords they should be short compelling and irresistibly clickable but the best thing about linkedin's ads program is it's really super super targeted and the platform lets you drill down and target audiences based on location gender age linkedin groups they're members of skills they've listed schools they attended or colleges and universities they graduated from and much more and a unique advantage that linkedin advertising has over adwords or facebook though is the ability to target by company name business category industry size job title and seniority so if you only want to reach vice presidents of marketing in north american digital technology companies with more than 500 employees you can and you can read more about this in some detail at business.linkedin.com forward slash 
marketing hyphen solutions. Now the exposure you'll get from LinkedIn ads is not as great as you get from Facebook or AdWords. But for the right business model, it's definitely worth considering. In some ways, the slightly less popular nature of this platform can work in your favour as there'll be less competition. One of the most phenomenal growth areas in recent years has been in the area of sharing photos and short clips as a tool for social communication. It's a great way to build an audience for your website or blog and a fantastic way to show off your product or service to people. As more and more people get smartphones, and most of the platforms we're going to cover in this video are smartphone-based, this can only get bigger. The main platforms that we're going to cover in this video are Snap, which was formerly known as Snapchat, Vine, and Periscope. Now let's take a look at Snap. This used to be called Snapchat, but it recently changed its name and it's going into hardware as well as software. Now, Snap works with a very specific media for communicating with users. And there are a couple of differences that make this platform unique and one of the most interesting social media platforms in use today. You know, like using photos and videos to communicate with other people. While Twitter and Facebook and most social media platforms mainly communicate with text, the only text you'll find here is the captions on pictures and videos. Another difference is that when you post your pictures and videos, they'll generally last for only 1 to 10 seconds, although you can post stories that can last up to 24 hours. Then they vanish like a ghost, hence the logo. And it's better to use stories more than snaps to advertise your products or services, because obviously they stay around for longer. So think of a story like a viral video. You know if you make it overly promotional, well, quite frankly, it's just not going to work. So you want something clever, something that no one has ever seen, and something that evokes emotion. And this will make people want to share the story with their friends, and it'll give you the exposure that you're looking for. Creating good stories will also make people want to follow you. So every time you create a story... Keep in mind that you're both trying to get people to follow you and you're trying to get your product or service out there. If you want to get a good idea as to how stories work and which ones are most popular, check out some of the Snapchat stories, and they still use the old name at the moment, on BuzzFeed. Breaking news! Snap Incorporated is releasing a new piece of hardware, Snap Spectacles. These are glasses with a built-in camera. Simply tapping on the side of the glasses will record 10 seconds of video footage from a first-person perspective. So now you can record video just like you're looking at it. It's almost like having a GoPro strapped to your head. Can you imagine the possibilities this is going to unfold? Now, the company will be releasing the product to the market soon, so best to set up a Google Alert to keep informed of the latest developments. Then there's Vine. And Vine is a social network where people can share six-second looping videos. Twitter thought so much of it, they acquired it for a reported $30 million. And that was before its official launch. As of December 2015, the last statistics that are available, Vine had 200 million active users. And users' videos are published through Vine's social network and can be shared on other services such as Facebook and Twitter. And Vine's app can also be used to browse through videos posted by other users. Now, when you're using Vine, the camera only records while the screen is being touched, and this enables users to edit on the fly or create stop-motion effects. And there were some additional features added to the app in July 2013, and these include grid and ghost image tools for the camera, curated channels, 
including themed areas and trending topics or users, protected posts and the ability to revine videos on a personal stream. Your approach to marketing on Vine and Periscope, which we'll get to in a moment, should be similar to your approach to Snap. Entertaining, shareable and not salesy. And you can see some Vine videos and download the app at vine.co. Finally, there's Periscope. Now, Periscope is similar to Vine insofar as it streams short videos. The key difference is that Periscope streams videos live. And when you use Periscope, you'll find that you're presented with a map of the world upon signing in. And on this map are various points where you can see people who are currently streaming video. So simply click on the dot on the map and the name of the broadcaster and then you can tune in and start watching what they're filming. You know, it's a bit like having your own TV station in that respect. And you can then comment on the video, you can ask questions, you can like it, you can follow the person or you can leave and watch something else. And in addition to the same strategies as for Snap and Vine, you can also use Periscope to get traffic to a website or visitors to a bricks and mortar store by running a flash offer. The geolocating feature means users can pinpoint where you are at that very moment. Now, these are just three of the new and exciting photo and video apps out there, and new ones are being developed all the time. By honing your strategy on these platforms, you'll be in pole position to start marketing on the newer apps and you know, as soon as they launch, which will put you one step in front of the competition. In order to get the best results from your social media marketing efforts, you must be everywhere and post to more than one social media platform at a time. And this can be accomplished in several different ways. You can spend some time each day on social media, but give your attention to a different platform every day. So, for example, you could update Facebook every Monday. Tweet to Twitter every Tuesday. Pin to Pinterest every Wednesday. Upload a video to YouTube every Thursday. Log in to LinkedIn every Friday. Snap a story on Snap every Saturday. And collapse into a heap on Sunday. There's got to be a better way. Well, there is. You can post the same or similar content to more than one social media platform at a time. And this can help spread the word about you, your products or services. And you can save yourself a ton of time in the process. For example, you could download videos from Vine or Periscope, edit them together and then upload the result to YouTube. Not only will you be able to get more subscribers and views to your YouTube channel, but you'll also be able to reach an audience that doesn't own a smartphone and therefore wouldn't have seen them on those other platforms. Downloading these videos is easier than you think. Just go to Vine Video Download, which is www.vinevideodownload.com or Scope Down, which is www.downloadperiscopevideos.com and follow the on-screen instructions. It's all really quite straightforward. When you post an article on your blog, rewrite it slightly and upload it to your Facebook page and to LinkedIn. You'll need to rewrite it so you don't get hit with a duplicate content slap on Google. But by writing it ahead of time in your word processor, this can be accomplished quite easily. Twitter and Instagram have similar hashtags. So when you post a new picture to Instagram, tweet about it on Twitter. You can also pin the picture onto your Pinterest board. You know, three social media sites covered in just a few minutes. 
You can also post your latest tweets on Facebook, or use them as a comment in a LinkedIn group. Although, of course, you must make sure that it is relevant. By doing it this way, you can save time and effort, and spread the word about you, your products or services much wider and much quicker. Your blog should be the hub of your social media strategy. I'll explain why in this video. There are a number of reasons why you should do this. First and foremost, everyone should be able to access your blog, regardless of what operating system they're using, and regardless of whether they're using a PC, a tablet, an iPhone, or an Android device. You know, everybody should be able to uh, get to your blog page, regardless. So once you've got people to your blog, you can then point them in the direction of your various social media platforms. And if you have a WordPress blog, this is particularly easy, as there are a number of plugins you can get to integrate social media. First and foremost, though, you should host your own blog on your own domain and on your own web server account, and this gives you more control than hosting on WordPress.com. So let's talk about integrating Twitter and your blog. Now, there are two ways that you can sync your Twitter account and your blog. You can incorporate a feed of your latest Twitter tweets into your blog sidebar, or you can automatically let Twitter followers know that you've updated your blog with a new post. For the former, you can use the Twitter Feeds plugin. Now, each time you post a tweet, it will automatically be displayed on your blog which has the added bonus that your blog content will change slightly and Google will treat it as new content and update its rankings in the SERPs accordingly. For the latter, you can use the WP to Twitter plugin, which will send a tweet to your followers to let them know that you've just made a new blog post. And both of these plugins can be installed from within the WordPress dashboard, and they're both free. And the same goes for Facebook. With the Facebook Auto Publish plugin, you can publish posts automatically from your blog to Facebook. You can publish your post to Facebook as a simple text message, a text message with an image, or as an attached link to your blog. And the plugin supports filtering posts based on custom post types as well as categories. And again, this can be installed from within the WordPress dashboard. Embedding a YouTube video into your blog is easy. To embed a YouTube video into your WordPress blog is very easy. All you do is copy and paste the URL into your blog post and WordPress will work out the embed code for you. So you don't need to do any coding or anything like that. Just copy and paste the URL and the WordPress software will take care of the rest. And don't forget, you can simply insert pictures that you've uploaded to Instagram or Pinterest into WordPress very easily. So why not do that as a separate post and then share it on other social media? Finally, you should make it easy for visitors to your blog to share your content as widely as possible. And the easiest way to do this is with the Shareaholic plugin. And the Shareaholic plugin basically puts a bar at the bottom of every page and every post on your WordPress blog, although you can set it up so that some things like, for example, uh, your shopping cart, if you have a shopping cart site, don't get shared. But what it does is it means that people who come to your site can simply click on the button and share the details about your site on their social media. So it helps you spread the word about your blog, about your site, far and wide on all sorts of different social media. And you can set it up to decide what social media you want your content shared on, and as I was saying, what pages you want to have shared. So it's fully customizable and you can install it from within the WordPress dashboard. So there you go, a few ways that you can make your blog the hub of your social media activities and spread your message far and wide.